meeting really interesting people and young females and all of them I'm encouraging them to tell their story and to be vulnerable and open and honest. And over the years, I think I've kind of been felt a little bit like I'm cheating oh, myself, where every yeah. day I'm getting them to tell their story, but meanwhile I'm, I haven't been able to find the words to tell my own. So um, it's kind of been it's simmering in the background, where for years I've wanted to talk about it, but just didn't know how. Um, so yeah, today's going to be the first day that I tell my story. <laughs> when I was five years old, um, and yeah, that was me, but I think I was about seven then, but this is me when I was around that age of five years old, I just started primary school and everything was good, I was this happy, young, excited, loved to sing little kid, and I was loud, centre of attention, and I started coming back home from primary school and mum started to notice ball patches on my head and we didn't really know what the hell was going on and mum started taking me to doctor's appointments and um, seeing skin specialists and they all were coming back saying I have alopecia areata. So it was just the odd ball patch at that stage and we had steroid creams that we would be rubbing all over my head every night and that was my routine going to bed. Mum would come up and say goodnight to me and rub this steroid all over my head. And it worked for a little bit where, you know, I'd come back and I'd have my hair and I'd be fine. Um, but that didn't always, you know, it wasn't a long-term fix. Um, I think about the age of 10, um, or nine, that's when I broke my arm and maybe that, you know, like there was this trauma, this stress, and my hair started falling out quite <laughs> significantly. Um, and if we just have a look, I can actually press some of the pictures. Yeah, it's um, Yeah, so you can kind of see here, this was the early beginnings of me losing my hair and the way that I could cover it up and hide it was wearing these cute little bandanas that would cover my ball patches and make me feel a little bit normal. Turn off the camera. And, and so, yeah, I was living my life, going through my primary school. I was in rep hockey teams. I was um, in plays. I was singing. I was competing in piano competitions. I was doing it all, and I was having fun, wearing my headband and not letting it affect me. And, you know, I think it was quite hard for my parents because my mum, going to hockey training, so I'd go up to my mum and they'd say, oh God, that's what happens when you push your children a little bit too much. And, <laughs> I don't mean, yeah, no, no. And thinking that they were, you know, yeah, giving advice. But, and it wasn't so hard for mum to have to hear that. But so yeah, it got to a stage where I couldn't hide my ball patches and um, yeah, my hair just started falling out. So we made the decision that I would then have to look at the option of wearing wigs, which wasn't great. So this was probably the worst that it got. And so I'd have my little headbands. But um, we first decided to go to the synthetic wigs, which was Cool, that was fine. Um, and but as a young girl, I think I was a bit ripped and bust, and and um, yeah, I didn't really look after them. And so then we found freedom. And I remember going to Diana and travelling up to Auckland, and so scared. I was probably looking like this, where I had that last little strand of my hair. I was in year five at school. And we went to Diana's house and I was pretty nervous and mum and dad were kind of saying to me like, look, this is gonna be it. This is, you know, like, you're wearing wigs now. And I was fine with that, that was okay. And we got in there and Diana said, you know, um, we're gonna have to take a mold of your head. So 
that needs to go. And that it was like, shit, really? <laughs> I was holding on to absolutely everything that I could to try and keep that dream alive that my hair was going to grow back one day. And so that was probably the most traumatic time in that period where you're saying goodbye to your hair. So out came the clippers, Deanna chopped it off. <laughs> <laughs> she was great though, and it was, it was sad. I was bawling my eyes out, my mum and my dad was holding it together, my sister was bawling her eyes out, and that was the moment I realised this is going to be my life from now on until if I can grow my hair back again. Um, yeah, so then I started wearing the wigs, but what I kind of, what I have skipped is that period of when I was losing my hair at primary school, being a five-year-old through to nine years old, the bullying and the comments, and as a young kid, I didn't really let that affect me, like I was still going out and playing my hockey and doing all of that stuff, but there were those comments where it was like, oh, you've got ball patches, and I would kind of be like, mm. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> and then I remember the principal coming up to me when I was swimming, saying, um, why are you wearing a headband in the swimming pool? And I was around my friends who didn't really know what was going on. Like, they were just my friends and they were not saying anything. But that's why I had to say to him, well, I've got alopecia. And so I wear, I wear a headband in the swimming pool. And I must have gone home pretty upset that night so mum called the school and just well, the principal and said you know this is the situation and yeah I mean the parents uh, the teachers were all all knew what was going on but I just never really wanted to talk about it because I just wanted to be a kid and have fun and carry on so I did and eventually some boys you know I thought that they liked me and they were teasing me or teasing me and like outside sports, so they ripped my hat off, and with that came my headband. And he yelled, one of the boys yelled, you have cancer. And I, I think that I was in, started year five at that stage, and I, that, I think, I, well, I probably felt quite upset about that, because I knew I didn't have cancer, I wasn't dying, I just didn't have hair, a lot of hair on my head. And so from that young age, I think the reaction that I got from these kids, I didn't want to experience that reaction again. So it was just a no-go talking topic for me growing up. So when I got this freedom wig, it was like, I'm a no, I'm a kid, I'm, I, look, I look normal, I've got alopecia areata, I've still got my eyebrows, I've still got my eyelashes. No one needs to know and no one can really know. So I was in a lucky stage where it was year six, so my final year of primary school. I was kind of moving on to the next phase, but I had these, some girls in this year six class that I had to deal with when I got this freedom work, and they were saying, oh, is that, is that are you wearing a wig? And I said, no. And, and so this is, this, this is where it all started, the, the, the lies that would come in my life that I, be trying to cover up the fact that I wear a wig. Do you wear a wig? No. Are they extensions? Yeah, yeah, they're extensions. And so you could see the girls in this class just become obsessed. And Anna was kind of talking about it before. Obsessed with finding out if, if it is real hair or if it isn't real hair. And so I'd say to them, look, no, I've got eyebrows, I've got eyelashes, look, I've got a scalp, it's real hair. And so I kind of fended off these girls. Then moving on to intermediate, found a new group of friends, and yeah, and I was playing my hockey. Um, I was a leader at my intermediate school. But then the questions started happening again and saying, is that a, why is your hair so perfect every day? Is that a wig? No. Are they extensions? Yeah. And so that would just be the storyline that I would go through in that phase of my life. Then getting to college, the same, I was able to do everything that I loved. I played my hockey, I was in the barber shop and 
I was a deputy head girl at my school, but still, nobody knew about my, or I didn't let on about my alopecia. But the same questions, do you wear a wig? No. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. See, I've got a scalp, I've got eyebrows, I've got eyelashes. And then it started going on where I would say, you know, like, look, I've got, I've got hair everywhere else on my body. And, and trying to prove to these girls that I'm normal and that I'm not different. Um, yeah, so that just carried, kept carrying on. And um, even when I went to university, I still didn't feel comfortable um, with telling anyone there. And some of my flatmates had absolutely no idea. My routine in the morning is I wake up, I have to shave my head because I still have about 15, I'd say about 15% hair growth, 85% baldness. I wake up in the morning, I shave my head, take my shower, shave my head, and then put my wig on and I go off on my day. Come home, I like to keep my hair on, but I just wear my hair a lot of the time. And then when I get ready to go to bed, that's when I take my hair off. And then I wear a beanie to bed. So this was just my routine. And I made sure I had a lock on my door, every flat that I was in, just so that I didn't have girls coming into my room and them walking in and finding me bald and wearing a wig. But so, yeah, it was only till about three or four years ago that I decided that I would start to tell some people. And I confided in one of my friends who was absolutely gobsmacked, she had absolutely no idea that this was happening, and then I went on and told another friend, and another friend, and another friend, and slowly I was building this confidence where I was feeling comfortable in telling people about my story. Um, and a lot of them had these suspicions, but they didn't know how to approach the topic with me either, and it was a vice versa kind of thing. So when I heard about this conference before COVID, I had seen that Anna Reid had posted up on her Instagram story. And I said to one of my friends, I was like, that I would really love to go there because I, yeah, I felt like I was this person in the media who's on TV and but living the secret, season. which just, I would like to, to be and the other ones having a conversation about more. Um, and so I reached out to the ladies here and they let me come along, so that's um, and then COVID happened and I was like, oh my God, this conference isn't going to go ahead. How, the, how am I going to bring this conversation up now? This was my in. And so then I was Googling, what day is alopecia day? <laughs> and then it came up in August and that was my day. That was what I was going to work towards and being able to let my story out there. So I wrote some, I had a little memo on my phone, wrote, my, wrote a little thing out, got my partner, got my parents to check it, and got my friend, had a little photo shoot in my bedroom where I got a nice little picture of just of myself, of me and my hair, and on that day, I put it out there, and I couldn't believe the response. It was, like, insane. And I kind of... The feeling was like I was coming out of the closet. And because, I mean, for years, people probably had these suspicions or they questioned it, but they put, and they didn't even, they wouldn't have even cared. But in my head, it was always in the back of my mind, like, oh, God, and I didn't want to have to worry about that. But anyway, I had all these nice messages of my friends from high school and from people from primary school messaging me and saying, I'm so sorry that you didn't feel comfortable to tell your story then. And they, and I, you know, like I 